In the first section, we will review a few critical concepts of normal neural processes. Remember, neural anatomy was covered in an earlier tutorial, and it may be a good idea to review that tutorial again before learning the material presented here. We begin with a review of the regional specification of the developing brain. There are five primitive brain structures in the developing fetus that go on to develop specific areas and cavities in the adult brain as follows. The telencephalon develops into the cerebral hemispheres and lateral ventricles. The diencephalon becomes the thalami and the third ventricle. The mesencephalon becomes the brain and aqueduct, while the metencephalon develops into the pons and aqueduct, the cerebellum and the fourth ventricle, and the myocephalon becomes the medulla. During development, the placenta is important for protecting the developing fetus from harm. In the adult, it is the blood-brain barrier that protects the brain. The blood-brain barrier is a physical barrier which occurs along capillaries that separate blood from cerebrospinal fluid and limits microscopic particles from passing into the CSF. It is composed of three structures, tight junctions between non-fenestrated endothelial cells, the basement membrane, and astrocyte processes. Transport across the blood-brain barrier can occur by the following mechanisms. First, there is slow carrier-mediated transport, which is a mechanism for moving glucose and amino acids into the brain and rapid diffusion of nonpolar or lipid soluble substances. Now let's take a closer look at the function of specific areas of the brain beginning with the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus has multiple functions that can be remembered with the mnemonic tan hats. Tan hats is in reference to thirst and water balance through the supraoptic nucleus, the adenohypophysis with control via releasing factors, the neurohypophysis releases hormones produced in hypothalamic nuclei, hunger and satiety are controlled through the lateral and medial hypothalamus respectively, autonomic regulation and circadian rhythms. The anterior hypothalamus controls the parasympathetic nervous system, while the posterior hypothalamus regulates the sympathetic nervous system. Circadian rhythms are regulated by the suprachiasmatic nucleus. The hypothalamus is also responsible for temperature regulation. The posterior hypothalamus heats when cold and the anterior hypothalamus cools when you're hot. And finally, the hypothalamus regulates sexual desire and emotions. Now let's take a closer look at the pituitary. The posterior portion of the pituitary gland is referred to as the neurohypophysis. It is composed of hypothalamic axonal projections from the supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei delivering ADH and oxytocin respectively from these nuclei. The anterior portion of the pituitary gland is referred to as the adenohypophysis. The thalamus acts as a relay station, receiving sensory information from the body and sending it to the cerebral cortex.
similar to the cerebral cortex, motor function is anterior to sensory function anatomically. Specific relay centers of the thalamus are as follows. The lateral geniculate nucleus, or LGN, relays visual stimuli. This can be remembered with the L in LGN standing for light. The medial geniculate nucleus, or MGN, relays auditory stimuli. You can remember this by the M in MGN as standing for music. The ventral posterior nucleus, or VPL, has a lateral portion that relays body sensations, while the medial portion of the ventral posterior nucleus, or the VPM, relays facial sensation. And finally, both the ventral anterior nucleus, or VA, and ventral lateral nucleus, or VL, have motor functions. Now let's take a closer look at the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex serves multiple functions, which are dependent upon location. For example, the principal motor area is in the frontal lobe just anterior to the central sulcus. The principal sensory area is in the parietal lobe just posterior to the central sulcus. The principal visual cortex is in the occipital lobe. The auditory cortex is in Wernicke's area of the temporal lobe. And motor speech is in Broca's area of the inferolateral frontal lobe. One region of the cerebral cortex is the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe of the brain controls executive function, such as concentration, planning, abstraction, language, judgment, inhibition, orientation, mood, and motor regulation. Damage to the frontal lobe leads to disinhibition and lack of social judgment. When studying the relationship between brain structures and their function, you will often run across a diagram called a homunculus. A homunculus is a graphic representation of the human body that illustrates some human function, in the case on this slide, motor function. Note that along the motor cortex, as you move laterally to medially, associated motor function moves from head to toe. Also note that the hand and face, which have multiple complex movements, occupy relatively more of the motor cortex. Now let's take a look at the structure and function of the spinal cord. There are three basic spinal tracts to be discussed relative to anatomy and function. The first are the dorsal columns. The medial lemniscal pathway is sensory in function, carrying touch, ascending pressure, vibration, and proprioception. It ascends ipsilaterally through the spinal cord, decussates in the medulla, and goes through the VPL of the thalamus to eventually reach the sensory cortex. The second spinal tract is the spinothalamic tract. It is sensory in function, carrying pain and temperature sensation. The spinothalamic tract ascends ipsilaterally in spinal cord gray matter decussates at the anterior white commissure and goes through the VPL of the thalamus to eventually reach the sensory cortex.
The third spinal tract is the lateral corticospinal tract. It is motor in function, carrying descending voluntary movements to contralateral limbs. The UMN originates in the primary motor cortex, decussates at the caudal medulla, and descends contralaterally in the spinal cord to synapse with the LMN at the cell body of the anterior horn, eventually reaching the neuromuscular synapse. Now while we're on the topic of spinal control of muscle, we need to discuss spinal muscle control. Muscle spindles are anatomically parallel to muscle fibers acting to control and monitor muscle length. A stretching muscle causes intrafusal stretch, which stimulates the IA afferent nerve, which then stimulates the alpha motor neuron at the spinal cord synapse, which causes reflex muscle or extrafusal contraction. Now let's wrap up our discussion of normal neural processes by looking at reflexes. During a neurological physical examination, several reflexes are tested to assess nerve circuits and aid in localizing possible neurological lesions. For example, the triceps reflex assesses the nerve circuit through the C7 nerve root while the biceps reflex looks at the C5 nerve root. The patella reflex assesses the nerve circuit through the L4 nerve root, and the Achilles reflex looks at the circuit through the S1 nerve root. Finally, the Babinski reflex is a positive reflex with dorsiflexion of the great toe and fanning of the other toes in response to rubbing the lateral sole of the foot. This response is normal in infants, but may indicate an upper motor neuron lesion in those greater than 12 to 18 months. Primitive reflexes are normally present in infants up to 12 to 18 months old, and may reappear in those who are older if they have frontal lobe lesions. Some primitive reflexes are the Moro reflex, which is extension of the limbs in response to being startled. The rooting reflex, newborn to four-month-old children will seek the nipple when the cheek is stroked. The Palmer reflex occurs when an infant grasps an object placed in the palm of their hand. And, as just described on the previous slide, the Babinski reflex is dorsiflexion of the great toe and fanning of the other toes in response to rubbing the lateral sole of the foot, and this is normal in infants.